Welcome to our pre-cal video week 1.2 or 1.b. Uh, in this week we cover graphing of linear quadratics and roots and some key features such as extrema and behavior and the even and odd, not functions, but even and odd polynomials. Okay, so the basics of graphing, this will kind of repeat throughout. You want to solve for your important information, create a t-chart of your x and y points, and then determine important information or important behavior. So important information might be intercepts, roots, um, whether it's increasing, decreasing, stuff like that. Well, actually, increasing, decreasing, you might want to consider a behavior. But in behavior, as far as our polynomials are going to go, today we're going to learn about leading coefficients and even in odd polynomials. Um, but you can also uh, identify extrema and behavior, uh, increasing, decreasing, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to start with something that should be a complete recall from previous math. Uh, that's this graphing of the linear equation. Of course, you guys might recall that formula y equals mx plus b. But just to start off, I'm going to go with what are important informations. Well, it's really easy to declare y is 0 and x is 0 and get two of those intercepts right off the bat. And so since that's pretty simple, I might as well just start there. I know a lot of you can recognize that maybe you already see your y-intercept. But let's just start with what we know. Let's set y equal to 0 and x equal to 0 and solve for that. And that becomes uh, 0 is equal to 7 half x minus 2. And this one, this would be y is equal to 7 half times 0 minus 2. That one's nice and easy. You know that there is a point at 0 comma negative 2. Again, you probably recognized it, and that's OK. And over here, we bring this 2 over. This becomes 7 halves x. You multiply by 2 sevenths multiply by 2 sevenths and you get 4 sevenths is equal to x. So there's also an intercept point at, oops, I did that backwards, 4 sevenths, 0. Okay, and so then you'd plot those points, 0, negative 2, and 4 sevenths is, let's say it's right here, and 0. Ah. And as you can see, it looks like our slope is positive. Of course, I could have checked right here and recognized that I had a positive slope right there. But I'm just going to kind of draw. We're just sketching. That's the whole purpose of this. It's just a simple sketch. But let's check our answer. And ta-da, there we go. Here's another one. This one, I am going to use that shortcut of the y equals mx plus b, where we recognize that that plus b, that is our x inter or sorry, a y intercept. So that means this is automatically uh, 0, 3. And so let's go ahead and mark that 0, 3. And then, of course, I can use my slope, negative 6. Uh, because it's negative, I know that my line must be going this way. It must be decreasing. And so that's down 6 over 1. So down 6 over 1. So now I've got two points. I can connect the dots, eh, sort of. Okay, so again, just basic sketching, just basic sketching. Can you get an image in your head? That's the whole purpose of recognizing our parent functions. Ta-da! Okay, so y equals negative 5. Uh, this is an important formula because it's important to recognize our two constant lines. And is y equals a horizontal or a negative? Or is our horizontal or a vertical? Uh, guys, the easiest way to remember here is if I told you that y is equal to negative 5, then what is x? So the easiest thing to recall here is this is negative 5. So x could be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. And no matter what, this is always negative 5 because I'm telling you y must equal equal negative 5. And so if that's the case, plot those points. Negative 3, uh, where are we going? Negative 5, negative 2, negative 5, negative, da, da, negative, negative, negative. And you can kind of start to immediately see that y equals must be horizontal lines. They must be horizontal lines. Okay, and so here's my proof. So then if y equals must be horizontal lines, what must x equals be? They must be vertical lines. Um, if it helps you to recall, because it's constant along that value, it's going to be opposite of your axis lines, if that makes sense. So that might be a pattern that some of you recognize. So then if x equals 5, I already know it's going to be right here. So let's check. And voila, there it is. So let's move on to the more important information. Um, let's graph some quadratics. So again, basic sketching. We're not trying to be perfect with our quadratics, at least not yet. Um, more important in this course is can you graph you know, exponents, logs, trig? Those are the more important things to move on to because quadratics we've seen in previous courses. So the bigger thing here is behavior. So 
We'll learn a lot about quadratic behaviors in today's lesson, but just really quickly, let's try this. Graph this quadratic equation. So what do I recognize? Okay, again, I can go ahead and if I know anything about quadratics, I could go ahead and start sketching it. If not, then I can start with y equals zero and x equals zero. It's always a really safe place to start. So if I set this and then I set this, Okay, so this automatically goes away. So I know that there is a point at zero, zero. So why not plot it? And then here, if I divide by three, zero divided by three is still zero. And then, and then, and then you still get zero comma zero. Well, look at that. So those are the same exact plot point. Well, if I remember anything about positive quadratics, I know that it's going to go up. If I wanted to, I could draw an X, Y, T chart and I could start plotting some points. I know this is going to be zero, zero, but I could do one, two, three, four, and I could get some points. But let's just say that we're doing basic sketching because that's what I told you. So I'm going to assume this is kind of what my graph looks like. And ta-da, it is kind of what my graph looks like. Let's try a little bit harder one. We have negative x squared plus 2x plus 1. So immediately I know because this is negative, my leading coefficient is negative, I've got a downward, uh, downward looking quadratic, a quadratic that's negative, a quadratic that opens facing down. Um, the other thing I could do is, of course, plot those zero points, but I am mostly concerned with that intercept point. So let's, or that vertex point. So let's declare y is equal to zero, x is equal to zero. So we get this. And this one kind of sucks because now you got a factor, possibly even quadratic form. So let's start on this side and see if this helps us out any. So I know this is going to disappear and I get y equals one. So that means there is a plot point at zero comma one. Okay, we don't officially know if it's a max at that point. Um, you would have to do a few more testings, probably an XY chart. But again, I'm just doing a very, very, very basic sketch. So I'm just going to guess, what if that is my vertex? I kind of just want to see how close I was. And look at that. That actually, oops, uh-oh. Oh, no, 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 0, comma 1. Okay, I was like, what did I do? All right, so... This is the one that I'm more concerned with and I'm more interested in. The Schmoop kind of had one similar, but the biggest thing to recognize here is I can't just leave it as x minus 3 squared. I actually have to finish that solve. A side note, guys, this cannot distribute. This will not happen. That is not how exponents work. So I'm going to expand. Since it said squared, that means there's two of them. And then I'm going to do my FOIL first, outer, inner, last. These are going to combine. I get x squared oops, minus 6x plus 9 plus 1. So I actually end up with x squared minus 6x plus 10. So again, I can go ahead and declare that x is equal to 0 and solve from there. So that becomes 0 squared minus 6 times 0 plus 10. This is all going to disappear. So I have a point at 0 comma 10. So 0 and all the way up here at so I know that this is a positive x squared, so it's probably going to go up. And I could find some other points, but I'm just going to go ahead and say that this is what I think my graph kind of looks like, which is weird that they gave us that graph. Ah, so I made a false assumption. I assumed that that was my vertex point, and as you can see, it clearly wasn't. I self-checked with a graph. This is a graph I created with Desmos.com. So what I should have done is actually created my XYT chart and gone from there. But again, I was just trying to get a general feel of what this graph may or may not look like. And we got a couple of the points right. We understood that there was a point at 0, 10. We understood that it was a positive upward facing quadratic. So we had some of it right. We were just a little shifted off. And that would have been fixed with that XY plotting some points, getting some real definitions. Okay, but let's move forward to roots. Awesome. So the bigger, the big thing here is to recognize what's impossible with roots. Remember that even roots, maybe not odd roots, but even roots tend to have that discrepancy, um, where things cannot exist. For example, we're never going to be able to take the square root of negative 16, but I can take the square root 
of positive 16 and that's going to equal plus or minus 4. So it's important to recognize that there are some values that may or may not exist with roots and that's okay. We can identify our imaginary subset. So the biggest thing here is to recognize the domain and range of this root function. So how are we going to do that? We're going to again start with y equals 0. More importantly, uh, we're going to figure out what cannot exist? Where is that domain boundary? That's the whole purpose of finding our domain and range with roots, is where are the boundary lines? Where, is it, where, does, where does the root become imaginary? That's kind of the point that we're looking for. So this is 0 is equal to 4 square root of x minus 2 minus 1. Bring the 1 over, divide the 4 away, and you get 1 fourth is equal to the square root of x minus 2. We're going to square that. This becomes 1 over, what, 16, and x minus 2. We add the 2, so this x is now going to be equal to whatever 1 16th plus 2 is. Um, and so you've got that, that teeny tiny little intercept right there, 2 and a 16th, whatever that is. So you've got 2 and 1 16th and 0, 2 and a little past 2, and 0. Okay, and then let's do our x side. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, 0 minus 2 minus 1. 0 minus 2 becomes, aha, here's that point. The square root of negative 2, could this possibly exist? No. So at this point, we've got our impossible, our imaginary points on this root. So I know that at x equals 0, something funky is happening. So let's test at 1. Let's see what's happening at 1. So I know that at x equals 0, we got something funky. What's happening at x equals 1? So let's try y is equal to 4, square root of 1 minus 2. Look at this. What happens at 1 minus 2? That's still negative 1. I cannot square root a negative 1. So now I know that there's a funkiness at 0 and at 1. I hope you're kind of picking up on the pattern I'm creating here because eventually you should just be able to see what is under the root that's going to make it negative. That's the big question you're asking yourself. What is under the root that's going to make it negative? In fact, what would make it up to 0? If you guess 2, you're 100% correct. So if I did 4 square root of 2 minus 2 minus 1, this becomes 0. Square root of 0 is still 0. 0 times 4 is still 0. So then you end up with negative 2. So if x is equal to 2, then you have a plot point at 2. Uh, sorry, negative 1. Why did I say negative 2? 2, negative 1. And so that's actually our domain restriction. That is where the domain begins. X values below, so X values, X has to be greater than or equal to 2, right? Oh, wait, I put that backwards. X has to be greater than or equal to 2. So that's part of our domain, okay? And we recognize that because if it was any less than 2, you recognize that you have a negative underneath your square root, which is not possible because it's an even root. It's a square root. So at 2, uh, negative 1. And then we had another intersection point right here. I remember I drew it in. And so now I know that nothing can possibly exist down here. I know that. I know that nothing is going to exist down here. And if I remember my parent function, what a root function kind of looks like, that's what I'm going to guess my sketch looks like. Let's check. Ta-da! Very, very close. So the biggest thing to do with these domains and ranges is to recognize where does the root become negative. So what I'd like you to do is I'd really like you to try this. This is a start example that I really like you to do. The very first thing you're going to do is you're going to set y equal to 0. And you can start with x equal to 0, but you may already recognize what is the value that would make that, that would kind of make that, one, uh, sorry, underneath the square root negative. What is the value that would make it 0? Because that's going to be your starting domain point. Uh, and I forgot to mention in the previous, we also recognized where the starting range point was. Our domain had to be greater than or equal to 2. Our range had to be greater than or equal to negative 1. So we figured out both points. I want you to attempt that on this one. Pause the video. Really try because I'm going to show you the answer in the next slide. All right. Welcome back. Here's that answer. I really hope that you were able to find something similar. You may not have necessarily figured out this point out here, but if you recognize this point, and you understood that because there was a negative in front of that, there, that, that, sorry, negative coefficient in front of your root, that your root's actually going this way instead of up. 
then you're starting to pick up and recall some of those functions inside of parent or some of those behaviors inside of our parent functions. And that's very important in this lesson. All right, moving on to our key features. We've got three things I'm going to talk about very quickly. Extrema, uh, end behavior, and even and odd polynomials, not functions, but polynomials. So extrema, you might have heard as called a max and a min, but there's actually two different types of extrema. There is the absolute or global, same word, people just use them interchangeably, and there's the local or relative extrema. So I've given you an image to kind of understand the difference. Your global max is the highest point. If you have a restricted domain, as you can see here, we obviously have a restricted domain on this, or it's a piecewise function. If you have a restricted domain, that endpoint can still be a global maximum. For those of you moving into calculus, that's an important concept that is actually one of the fundamental theorems in calculus. So it is kind of important to recognize that a global max could be, if you, you might include it as an infinity, it could also be that actual endpoint on a restricted domain. On a restricted domain, you can actually have a global max. But what about local maximum? So I have this hump right here. It is the highest other point. Besides the boundary extending off to infinity, it is the highest other point. You don't necessarily have to have global or local maximum or minimums. That's not a necessity. And so I already mentioned about the endpoints. So just recognize that we can call our negatives and positives as we go off into infinities. We technically can call them uh, max and mins if we needed to. Um, if you restrict them, you would absolutely consider the endpoints if it was a true max and it was a true min. As you can see here, even though this max is heading towards an infinite positive bound, this min is not, like this is not just heading back down. This is my global minimum. It is the lowest point on the visible graph. And so it is important to recognize that phrase, the visible graph, when you have a domain restriction. If you have no domain restrictions, you can use the graph as you see fit and you can envision the endpoints. All right, so really quickly, I've got three questions, two on absolute, one on, on a relative. As you can see, I do have a domain restriction. So let's go ahead and highlight that domain restriction. I know that I'm only allowed to look at between negative three, ah, I went too far, between negative three and negative one. So I'm only really allowed to look at these two little sections right here. So, Let's look at it. In these sections, and I'm including the domain restriction, just a recall about set uh, notation. This means to include the values. This means to exclude the values. Yes, you can mix them. Okay, so I know that I've got a point here and a point here to look at. And so do I have the largest min and the largest max? I sure do. The minimum and the maximum. I'm going to Go ahead and just mark them. If we looked at that value, it's like negative 3, 3, and negative 1, 7. And let's check our answer. Ta-da! It's exactly correct. Okay, so there was an absolute min, there was an absolute max inside the restricted domain. If I didn't restrict this domain, then this would be a local min, a local max. You could call this the absolute max, and you could call this the absolute min. So it's just kind of how you see it. Some people might say that there is no absolute max and min because we're bounding and we're, we're sorry, infinitely approaching something. So that some people might consider it that way. Okay, again, we've restricted ourselves to zero through five. So that's right about here. So this is the only part of the graph I'm really looking at. So let's see, I see a max, but at five, I don't really see a defined minimum, but what I could do because it's a restricted domain, I could solve for that endpoint. So I can look at the graph and see that I have a max at zero comma two. The min I know is at X value five, but I don't know my Y value. So what's the easiest thing to do? Plug it in. Okay, so now I know that I have a point at 5 comma 8 over 29. So I don't I can't read that from the graph. I'm going to trust in my math and so let's check our work. Woo, look at that. Absolutely correct. Okay? Now we're talking about relative extrema. There is no domain restriction. I see a hump here and a hump here. I've got a bound and I've got a bound. So this would be technically a global max. This is technically a global min. Some would say because it's bounding infinitely, 
we don't technically call it that way, so it's just which textbook you're reading. But this right here is our local max, and this is our local min, and it's an easy graph so I can read it. Uh, that's 1, negative 2, and this is, oh, that's in between. I can't quite read it. So I'm going to call it 2.5, I don't know, uh, and negative 3.3. Let's just try those. Okay, 7 thirds and negative 86 27 probably similar. If I really wanted to make sure, I would go to a graph. Is this the right graph? Yeah, I would go to a graph and I could check them. Okay, negative 1, 2, and here 2.33 and negative 3.185. So I was a little bit off. I said 2.5 and negative 3.3, but we're very, very close within decimal places. And so, again, it's not about being perfect. If I wanted you to be perfect, we, I'd force you to make a T-chart and this, that, and the other. The purpose here is to understand behavior and to really, really, can you mentally sketch these graphs? Can you mentally sketch them? Then you're good to go. And if you can mentally sketch it, you can physically sketch it. And so that was the purpose of today's video. All right. Last two key features, even odd polynomials. Again, we're not discussing even odd functions. If you recall this from previous lessons, from previous years, fun, even odd functions, you're talking about symmetry. That's not what we're talking about here. We're discussing even odd degrees in polynomial. And just to recall, what is a degree? So this right here is a degree, x to the whatever. This right here is what we call the leading coefficient. It's whatever number is in front. And if it's just x cubed, then my degree is 3. My leading coefficient is the invisible positive 1 that's in front of it. What about negative 3x to the fourth? My degree is 4. My leading coefficient is negative 3. So let's look at that. I've given you this chart. I highly recommend that you make some sort of version of this. It doesn't have to be perfect. If you can kind of see my very, very basic chart that I drew for myself before I found this amazing image, um, it's super simple. It just says even, odd, positive, negative, up down, down, up, up, right. like it's super simplistic. It doesn't need to be all of this. But if you want to take a screenshot of this, absolutely do it. But let's use our even odd behavior just to get a basic sketch. It doesn't need to look beautiful. It just needs to be the most basic of sketches. So the first thing I want to do is look for my largest degree. Okay, so that's my largest degree. Technically, this is a degree of one. Okay, so looking at just this information, I now know that my degree is three and my leading coefficient is negative two. So this makes it odd and negative. Okay, so let's see odd and negative. So this is what my graph should basically look like. It should come from up and it should go down. And because it's cubic, it probably, and cubic, and it's not just a basic cube, it has some, some expansions, it's probably got some sort of humps going on or something like that, okay? Uh, if we want to really see what it looks like, we could go to the graph. And I think I have it pre-set up. I sure do. Ooh, whoa. Got to zoom out a little bit. Ah. Okay, as you can see, I was a little bit off on my humps, but uh, it went from up, there's something funky happening in the middle, and it went down. That's all we really needed to know about this. Okay, what about this one? Um, in order to finish this, I may have to factor it out, or I could make a guess about what's just happening with that leading coefficient. So there's two different ways you could see it. Some of you might like to fully solve it out. Some of you might recognize, okay, well, 3x times x is going to become 3x squared, and nothing else is going to multiply to it. And then if I multiply, then that becomes 3x to the fourth. So you might you might have that thought process and be able to go from there. That's fine. For those of us who don't, I'm going to go ahead and completely factor this out and then finish the multiplication so you can see it. And I know I'm coming up on time. I promise there's only a couple more uh, slides up. So 3x times this becomes 3x squared. This becomes negative 18x. This becomes x. And this becomes negative 6. And that's still multiplied by that x squared. This right here in the center is going to become negative 17x. And then if I multiply across, this becomes 3x to the fourth, negative uh, 17x cubed minus 6x squared. So again, this is still my largest degree. It is even and it is positive. So even and positive. So it should look like this. So I'm going to draw and I know that it kind of goes like this. Because it's a fourth and not a square, there might be something funky, funky happening in the center. We're not 100% sure. We didn't test all the points. And let's see. As you can see, there was a little bit of funkiness right here. It goes from up to up, and there's a max way or a min way 
down here, way, way, way down there. And that's okay. I'm not going to go all that way. But we got it correct. All right. The final thing we're talking about is end behavior. What is end behavior? You're literally talking about the ends of the graph, especially if the graph is going off into an infinite point or uh, one of the X or the Y's are going off into an X and, uh, to an infinite point. That's very important. Right now, you guys might have seen it as X approaches, Y must approach and as blah, 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 blah. Eventually, we're going to learn how to turn that into a limit and whatever that information is. But we're not there just yet, and so that is okay. All right, so we've got this. I've set this up. You can pause. You can copy this down. Really, it's just kind of getting you used to this concept. To make my life easier, I went ahead and got the three graphs. So I'm not going to try and have you guys be crazy. Let's just go ahead and look at those graphs. So my highest degree is 5. My leading coefficient is positive. So let's check that. If I'm odd and I'm positive, I should start from down and go to up. Boom, my graph is correct so far. But as x goes to negative infinity, so as x goes this away, what is my y doing? It's going to negative infinity as well. As x goes this away to positive infinity, what is my y doing? It's also going to positive infinity. That's all I'm asking you to do on these. So what I'd like you to try is number three. I'm going to do number one. My degree is one. My sign is negative, so it must be a decreasing linear. As x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity. As x goes to positive infinity, y goes to negative infinity. So again, I want you to try number three on this page. Pause and attempt it. And on this page, I want you to try number four, and I will show you five and six. So here, my largest, uh-oh, is that a typo? I guess not. Okay, so these are actually going to cancel each other out. So my largest is actually two with a negative and so that's exactly what this is representing so that's kind of funny um, but so as x goes to negative infinity y also goes to negative infinity as x goes to positive infinity y still goes to negative infinity over here again I can just look at my end behavior I already know what's happening but just to make sure my degree is a six my sign is negative so again I know it should be both heading down and that's cool so try number four really just try it and that's all I've got for you guys. So I'll see you next week in class.